Um, so I'm very pleased to welcome everyone to the talk tonight, um, which is especially exciting for me to hear from the curators of ZKM. Um, since its founding in 1989, uh, the ZKM in Karlsruhe in Germany has collected and or produced over um, a thousand digital artworks of various kinds. In fact, I learned recently that the Computer Arts Society co-founder, the late Alan Sutcliffe, actually has a digital graphic work in the collection of ZKM. Their long experience has made ZKM a centre of expertise for the preservation of such artworks, and particularly under the leadership of the late Peter Weibel, who sadly passed away in March 2023. The interdisciplinary team of conservators, computer scientists, engineers, technicians and historians are looking for solutions to exhibit and maintain these artworks in a rapidly changing environment. For me, ZKM has become one of the most important, if not the most important, media art museums in the world. Um, I first exhibited at ZKM in 2015 as part of Global XO Evolution and have since participated in three other shows at ZKM and two off-site shows in France and China. So I've seen the care, attention and great respect the team there has for the artworks they curate and collect. And this is why I thought it was so important to invite them to give a talk for the Computer Art Society so we can share learning and, um, and share from their great expertise in this area. Morgan and Beatrice um, will take us on a journey through a selection of recently acquired artworks um, from recent exhibi exhibitions such as Biomedia and explore different challenges they faced while exhibiting and preserving these works. They'll also talk about other case studies and present, um, and present them to highlight how preservation um, affects the ZKM collection concept and their scientific project. So the two speakers that we're going to hear from tonight are Morgan Strico, um, who's the Senior Media and Digital Art Conservator at ZKM Centre for Art and Media in Karlsruhe, Germany. She's responsible within the Department Wissen Collections, Archives and Research for the acquisition documentation of media and digital artworks. She holds a PhD in Media Archaeology from the École Supérieure Art et de Design Olin in France and conducted many research projects in the conservation of software-based artworks in the last 10 years. Beatrice Seidenberg is a trained art historian working at the intersection of art, science and technology. She's part of the Dust Institute in Vienna and the artist research collective LIM. Currently, she's a curatorial trainee at ZKM, where she co-curated the exhibition Biomedia, which provides insights into possible forms of coexistence between organic life and artificial agents. Most recently, she co-curated the last group exhibition by the late Peter Weibel, Renaissance 3.0. So without further ado, I hand over to Morgan to start the evening's proceedings. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very, very good presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I will start sharing my screen. Yes. Is it working well? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like just to start with a small uh, introduction just to our collection so that you know what we are talking about and then I will hand over to Beatrice about the exhibitions and when then we will finish uh, on the conservation of this collection. So the ZKM is all is a is a house for all genres and we have approximately 12,000 works from the 20th and 21st century in our collection. Uh, ZKM has collected, like you said, uh, about 1,000 digital artworks with different typologies. So we have interactive and immersive installations, uh, video and kinetic sculptures, web-based artworks, video and video games. Among these 1,000 digital artworks, about 200 are software-based, um, which this represents only 2% of the collection, but still uh, we host the biggest collection of software-based art in the world. Uh, so 2% of a collection, but 200% of our human power and time are necessary to take care of these works. Uh, a team of more than 20 persons are actually taking care of maintaining these artworks on a daily basis and try to anticipate on future problems that could prevent us uh, to, to exhibit those artworks. 
So during and in between exhibitions, the works must be continuously checked and maintained. So under Henrik Klotz and Peter Weibel's uh, direction, the ZKM became the mecca of media arts and built a collection that does not only deal with the innovations of communication and information technologies, but also the social change set in motion by them. Especially with the softer base collection and the focus on preserving them, we are proud to be a house where the public and the researchers can learn about the cultural context of the history of technology. So the ZKM hosts uh, and cares for very different typologies of digital artworks with a big representation of the 90s uh, first experimentations and productions of interactive artworks assisted by computer. I would like now to highlight some examples of artworks of our collection that illustrates this artist's uh, interests and techniques to hijack certain technologies prior purposes and experiment with computer capacities. For example, early artworks using computer controlled last discs were bridging video art and video game techniques. The Castle movie map, for example, by means of a driver's instrument panel mounted on a plinth, an Apple II SE, and a Laserdisc player, the viewer can experience a simulated journey in the extensive network of the CAFAV, the Castle Regional Transport Network. So the movement in space is limited to forward and backward until you reach a crossroad where there is an additional possibility to turn left or right. With portrait one, uh, the visitor here can start a conversation with Marie. This installation requires a Macintosh SA13 computer equipped with a serial port, a touchpad and a Laserdisc player. The offering and delivery software was developed on HyperCard and the visitors uh, are using the touchpad to select question from imposed uh, list. Uh, we are at the beginning of the 90s, so of course there must be an, like a, a tree uh, structure to make it easier to navigate the artwork. Sorry. So here with Ubiquita with Watchdog, also from the 90s, uh, it's using also a Macintosh. You have a video mural showing a swank cocktail party, and this interior is protected by a wall of cement blocks and chain link uh, fence, rather wire, and a German shepherd, or rather a video of a German shepherd. This dog is sensing your presence and barks more and more as you are approaching the gate. Here, the, the laser disc is controlled via a video camera and an elaborate custom-made video analyzer made by David Rockaby which define in which zone the visitor stands in order to play back the corresponding dog's behavior. ZKM has a house of production, allowed and still allows artists to access technologies they couldn't afford, resulting, for example, in a unique collection of SGI-based artworks, which restoration challenges are as unique uh, and therefore difficult as no other museums or collecting institution is facing this conservation issue of SGI computers. So among others, uh, I will show you those three artworks, uh, SGI based. First, Memory Fiatta VR by Agnes Egedus from the late 90s, where the visitor can explore four different virtual worlds thanks to a 3D mouse interface. Legible City by Jeffrey Shaw, early uh, 90s, so late 80s. Uh, you can here literally bike into a virtual city of letters. And finally, with Interactive Plant Growing by Christa Somorer and Laurent Mignonot, you can touch real plants and then you will grow a virtual garden. So artworks can take different uh, forms to afford physical interaction and engage with the public image or body for example, uh, Touch Me, as the title of this work clearly states, invites the visitor to touch the artist's face only to discover your own image instead, mingling with hers as you touch different areas of the screen. Opera Sonic Dimension by Daniela Kuczak and Reggiane Cantoni, 2005, encourage also to touch the virtual strings to experience sound specially. When touched, they begin to vibrate and sound like strings of a harp. 
With light contact from Senocosme 2010, the visitors are invited to touch each other this time to activate sound and light ambiences. Each physical contact between spectators generates a sound with a light color, which vary according to intensity of body's uh, combined electrostatic energy. Lynn Ashman lesson with America's Finest is using a double meaning of the word shooting to put the visitor in a rather uncomfortable situation. Looking through the viewfinder of the weapon, the spectator sees video footage of atrocity and war. When the trigger is squeezed, their own image captured by a video camera mounted on the wall is superimposed over the footage. Caught in the crosshairs, the viewer becomes the target of his own or her own action and as an aggressor becomes the victim. Kirsten Geisler on her side on the late 90s used the possibility of speech-to-text speech to technologies developed by Philips with Dream of Beauty 2.0. The reaction of this beauty, this perfect, beautiful, healthy, and immortal female head that uh, Geisler developed in many productions, were trained with the help of a lexicon. Depending on which words or phrases the beauty understands via a phone, different video files are played. She laughs or wink, but seemingly only when she feels like it. So very early, the desire to remove any type of physical interaction between the artwork and the public has been a topic of interest for artists way before the Kinect, as you could see uh, with Paul Garin, you pick it up with Watchdog. Later, the artist Shane Cooper explored body tracking with reflection in 2002. For this artwork, the viewer stands in front of a wall and has an image of another person standing a similar way of them uh, projected onto the wall. It starts out empty, but over a long time, many thousands of observers are recorded. So this piece acquires a life of its own, increasing in its ability to mimic and follow observers in the present using images of previous observers from the past. Today, no need to build up databases of positions during exhibition. They are all programmed beforehand. As for body trackings, the Kinect has been a big step forward. As you can see here with Skin 3.0 by Tristan Schutz, 2022, where visitors can wear countless variation of material combinations and textile uh, designs while dancing on music. To finish on collection and before giving the word to my colleague Beatrice, I would like to point out that the unfair underrepresentation of women of women in, is beginning to find a balance today, at least for digital art. First, thanks to our choices for new acquisition as well as pieces exhibited but also when it comes to case studies presented in conferences like today or selection for restoration or research projects. The backward acquisition today of early works from the 90s by artists such as Kirsten Geisler or Stansfield and Oikas is helping to strike this balance for the historic collection. As for new acquisition, little, little effort is required as the representation of women is naturally balanced today as you will see in our latest acquisitions. For restoration projects, the loan aspect for international outreach of female artists has been a drive for us. Memory Theatre Viewer is a good example of this. We could still exhibit it in-house with heavy maintenance, but no longer loan it because of its fragility. But all of this I will dive further after Beatrice's presentation. Beatrice, the floor is yours. Merci, Morgan. Can you hear me? Cool. Um, thanks a lot, Anna, and the whole PCS um, community and society for hosting us and inviting us. I will just briefly say a few words um, what we are going to do, and then I will start to introducing the first exhibitions. So during our talk, as Morgan already started to introduce, we would like to give you first an insight into the selection, procedure, and presentation of artworks from a curatorial point of view by focusing on the last major exhibitions. These are Biomedia, The Beauty of Early Life, and Renaissance 3.0. And secondly, through a selection of recently acquired artworks within these exhibitions, the different challenges that are faced while exhibiting and preserving will be addressed by Morgan. 
And furthermore, other case studies will be presented to highlight how preservation affects the Tetra and collection concept and scientific project. So I hope you can see my screen. I will start um, with a biomedia exhibition. The exhibition invites visitors to learn about and discuss possible forms of cohabitation between organic and artificial life forms. The idea for the exhibition was born from Peter Weiber's long theoretical endeavor. Um, I might just interrupt. We've got a lot of background noise, actually. Yeah, I'm here in the workshop area, which oh, okay. has the best internet, <laughs> so can't do anything about it. Okay, fair enough. Um, I hope they will leave soon. Um, so, um, it is this phenomenon that he points biomimetic media or biomedia. And from the beginning, it was clear that to the critical team that neither neither we want to give a utopian or positive insight where technology and humans live and work peacefully together, nor is it dystopian view where technology 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 replaces humans. So it was exactly the dialogue between that emerged that was of interest of us and we wanted to highlight in this exhibition. So we were interested in contemporary physicians who manipulate, hack, adjust, and transform media, giving it a new giving it a new purpose for life. In total, we have over 60 artworks, projects on display. In total, we had 60 different artworks and projects on display. And next to the commission works, such as the Living Architecture by Sita, that you can see in the, here in the background, this kind of colorful um, membranes, and which actually took like several weeks uh, of calibration, calibration adjustment in the exhibition space. We also had um, scientific research partners working in the field of bionic. Uh, one you see here on the left by, by Festo and on the right hand um, soft robotics by EPFL and Lausanne, which are especially interested into how robotic can serve also in medical terms by um, introducing soft robotics um, to the human body and will then deliver like specific medical treatment. And um, there were of course artworks from the collection, for example, here Gordon Pusk. And um, we had also artworks that were developed during a residency at the Hertz Lab, which promotes activities around electronic music and digital art through guest artist programs. And one that I would like to, to highlight is um, this artwork by um, Anna, the Katrin Hochschul and Anne Donovan called Empathy Storm. It's an interactive performative installation that features self-made robots, approximately 25 of them. And um, they explore abstract versions of human-machine interactions in which movement behavior functions as a mutual language. The artists argue that as humans are robots, social creatures, thus we need to think artificial empathy rather than artificial intelligence. Their research is based on virtual behavioral experiments from the 40s to the 80s, where the participants assigned human characters to simple shapes and narratives about the red behavior. The artists combined the parameters from the scientific studies and transformed them into a physical space. People are invited to take off their shoes and enter the shared habitat. Every movement has an impact on the behavior of the swarm visualized with colors that change according to the interaction with each other and with human visitors. Unfortunately, I don't have time here to delve further into the mechanics and construction of this piece. Um, Morgan will um, explain later more about this, but I want just to highlight specifically the, um, the interaction with the artist during and um, 
before installing the piece. Um, during the residency, we were constantly exchanging ideas and texting, testing the different setups. It became clear that the swarm demands a lot of human care and instructions for visitors. The maintenance became as part of the artwork itself, as the digital creatures do not need less attention than art organic ones. Throughout the exhibition, students assisted changing and charging the batteries and starting debugging the software, repairing or exchanging broken robots, etc. So you see here in the background also the batteries that um, are part of the of the robots. So all the human and non-human beings involved were learning each day something new, and the project evolved during the display in different directions. This process continues and it's handed over to the ZKM collection and under the guidance of Morgan and her team. As with other projects in the exhibition, Biomedia became a testing ground for biomimetic artworks, therefore we called also the exhibition a living organism. Literally, this became the topic of the next exhibition in collaboration with the Natural History Museum in Karlsruhe. Coming from a scientific point of view, ZKM included modern and contemporary positions to speculate on the origin of life. And by speculate, I mean that often the proposals by artists were not in direct translation of the scientific findings. However, we needed to negotiate with scientists to give voice and space to a variety of approaches to the origin of life, since as art, scientific discoveries are also based on matter, such as fossils to undermine the hypothesis. Hypothesis. And one artwork um, that entered the ZKM collection is this piece by Anna and Alex, the Archaeobot. And this underwater robotic installation explores what life might mean in a post singularity and post climate change future. Based on the research on Archae, combined with the latest innovations in artificial intelligence and machine learning the artists have tried to create the ultimate species for the end of the world. By magnifying and reproducing the movement patterns of, of an archive, which is a group of unicellular microorganisms, we can imagine how the encounter with these creatures might open up a new possibility in technology in medical treatment. And the maintenance was um, quite straightforward since Akilbot lives in a closed environment and works independently from outside inputs. So Biomedia and Early Life started with a conversation about how to care for and understanding living matter in an exhibition space. And the latest one, currently still on show in ZKM, so if you have the chance to visit Karlsruhe, please have a look at the show. And this exhibition even challenges and stretches strict regulations of contemporary museums even further. This is the last exhibition that was create, created by Peter Walde before he passed away. And it focuses on the alliances of art and science in the 21st century. With the rise of technical media, a turning point had come. Artists began to take an interest in the use of scientific tools. Today, both disciplines increasingly work with the same tools, methods, and programs. This common pool of tools point to the beginning of the new Renaissance, which has biochemistry, genetic engineering, and neuroscience at its center. During the span of the exhibition, micro microbial fuel cells are growing, which you see on the right-hand side in Julie Freeman's work. Biopolymer is being digested, which you see here in Thomas Feuerstein's work, and yeast is bubbling, as you see in the work Fermenting Futures. And this metabolic exhibition very surprises and unforeseen excitements, especially Sascha Spachal's biotechnical installation Earthling was a fruitful challenge. You can see here an overview um, how it was displayed at Ars Electronica and it has a similar setup at ZKM. As humans breathe in and out, metabolizing the space around them, the installation, installation breaths as well. Earthing consists of three parts. The inspiration station gives off microbacteria, 
that we see here um, in the foreground. Um, and the bacteria that is being inhaled um, is to say that it has a happiness enhancing effect. So I hope that the visitors will be happier after visiting her installation. And the expiration station that you can see here and here in the back receives this previously inhaled microorganism um, and along with the exhaled air. An extract of the graveyard cypress purifies the air again before it is brought to the central unit, the symbiome container, which you can here see uh, enlarged. In it, a red clover is interacting with the ry rhizobium bacteria and acts as a control center of the process. On its way there, the air passes through a series of biome containers on the floor, which you can see here. And these biomes inhabited um, different organisms and in inanimate matter. Thus, the installation confronts us with the following questions and quests. How long can the ecological system be exhibited before collapse? Under which conditions? Can it even die or collapse? And how do we know? How much interaction with the visitors does it allow? And this was also the first time that Sasha exhibited this piece for such a long time, over like almost a year. Um, so the set guidelines for artists and the museums are being shifted constantly regarding what is possible and under which conditions. There is simply no recipe when it comes to displaying living matter in such an exhibition period. We were surprised that shortly after the inoculation of the expiration station that you can see here enlarged on the right side, the personal microbiome of everyone entering the room was visualized in a hairy, colorful, and patchy living sculpture. So this was after inoculating um, the Aga Aga, which was on this glass sculpture, two weeks um, during the install. So the exhibition wasn't even open then, and already there were like different species growing on the sculpture. And Sasha was surprised at how differently the bacteria and organisms strive at ZM compared to other galleries. So living matter is already in museums. It is not an aseptic space. In order to overcome the initial skepticism and concerns when displaying biological art, it is key for the museum team to learn and be curious about the actual material and the symbiosis with human and non-human entities. In the case of the installation Earthlink, the conservation team needed to stay constantly in touch with the local garden shop to source and grow the red clover this is, which is in symbiosis with the rhizobium bacteria to fix nitrogen and thus fertilizes the soil. For another artwork, we needed to collect wastewater to power microbial fuel cells from the local sewage. So you can imagine uh, how, how such a long bureaucratic chain and uh, paperwork this um, accumulated. So we needed to guarantee that there will be no hazard for the museum workers and visitors. So the last piece I want to um, show you is by Lynn Hirschman Leeson. Um, it's um, a convolute of um, many different pieces. It's like um, yeah, a spatial installation, which was acquired 2014 by the ZKM. And Lynn Hirschman brings here actually a lab into the exhibition space. And her modular project includes recent discussions about biogenetics were bringing new forms into being using genetic manipulation as glowing fishes. Moreover, the artist saved her research material on a DNA sample, which is inserted into a closed white room door. So you see it here on the, on the right. And in doing so, Lynn Hirschman uses a storage medium, which is currently under development. And this might be also like a future data memory system for museum conversation, conversation just inserting this in the DNA, or as also um, Anna and Alex are doing research on how to store documentation about their works on blockchain. So this is kind of a, yeah, a future hint on what is possible um, to store 
the art group's data for, for indefinite time. And before handing over to Morgan, I would like to share a last observation. Artworks stemming from the close exchange and collaboration with scientists have to leave the lab and the guardianship of the artist and be placed in the care of the museum team. So a technical right is key, but it does not replace the close dialogue during the setup with the technical and conservation team. So from this presenting exhibition and projects, I personally got to know more about programming, robots, metabolic processes, and our environment than just by attending dry lectures. And I will hand back to Morgan. Thank you. Very interesting, <laughs> actually. Um, I'm going to share again. Good. So I'm going to talk to you of what's happening after. But before that, I think um, as a starting point, I would like to dive into the world of digital art preservation in general a bit deeper before talking about the newly acquired artworks. So the DETKM, like uh, Anna said, is what we can call a center of expertise for the preservation and restoration of uh, media and digital art. The success of preservation efforts depends mainly on three things, the availability of diverse expertise, the experience and spare material. So conservators, computer scientists, electrical engineers, technician and art historian from two different departments work uh, closely together. The department Wissen, collection archives and research and the department museum and, and exhibition technical services. So together, we are um, committed to show the public as long as possible witnesses of an artistic practice shaped by the technology available at the time of creation. Exhibitions are really a real chance for ZKM visitors and researchers to see early digital and media artworks in their legacy hardware and software environment. Interactive laser disc installations, early virtual reality, generative art, so at ZKM, we preserve, but also we display artworks with their historical materials for research purposes. So it implies to keep as long as possible the artworks with their historical software and hardware components, not necessarily with the very components acquired along with the artwork. It can be the same model or at least from the same period or compatible with the initial system. That way, we do not have to make major changes, for example, of the software environment or peripherals in order to avoid incompatibility issues or alterations of the artwork's behavior and outputs. Some visitors will certainly have noticed that we also had to technically update some of the artworks to today's standards. So while preserving these artworks in their historical media technical ecosystem, we are facing, of course, dysfunction and hardware failure due to normal aging of the components and also planned obsolescence that we usually cope with our extensive stock of spare parts at ZKM or with the help of secondhand markets. But as artists are often using modified pieces of hardware or very rare, unusual, custom or even handmade hardware, we, open, we happen to face a lack of spare parts or simply a lack of knowledge. There is some messages. I don't know if it's... Oh, sorry. So this lack of spares forces us to change the hardware, which implies a whole other set of software-related challenges. Hardware-software interdependency, lack of source code, driver or installer, lack of software documentation and support, license issues, um, loss of skills, of course, and loss of knowledge. The combination of these problems usually results in the adaptation of the work to contemporary media technical um, ecosystems. Our first example of biomedia to be acquired by ZKM is Interactive Plant Growing by Christa Sommerer and Laurent Mignon. The experience happened to be a success. Just as the preservation of this living ecosystem, the plants, has been as smooth as possible, 
so has the preservation of the technical media ecosystem. For the living ecosystem, we decided to keep the plants into our little gardening area at ZKM between the different displays of the work instead of throwing them away as mere objects after ex exhibitions. For this, we created a network of care within the teams to water them and maintain them. As for the program, bringing, uh, bringing the virtual garden to life, another type of network of care was created. So interactive plant growings, virtual plants were original, originally programmed with C language with Irix GL by Laurent Mignano and Christa Sommerer on the silicon graphics computer. You have it on the pic, uh, picture on the top. So it's a SGI Indigo 2 Supreme graphic from 1992. As this artwork's code is compact and light, since it involved only uh, variables and graphic vectors, Laura and Krista were able to migrate it from IRIX to Windows 95, then Windows XP, then Windows 7, 10, and lately 11, using C++ with OpenGL, keeping the same exact aesthetic. There is no visual differences between the 1992 version and today's version. There's small jumps and, and the use of widely used libraries with no dependency to proprietary software allow for a very smooth migration of the work. The interface used between the plants and the computer was custom made with widely available components for which we acquired a lot of spares for the future. To be able to make this kind of migration or to maintain the work in its historical media technical ecosystem as long as possible, the acquisition period is the most crucial one. Today, um, our acquisition workflow is reflecting our awareness of what we learned from the past, as well as the challenges we are facing now and trying to anticipate the one we may face in the future. So our acquisition workflow includes basically communication with the artist to, or artists to gather as much information as possible. The goal here is to have enough information to set up and maintain the artwork by ourselves and gather every pieces of hardware, software, material needed to display the work. As these artworks only exist in their installed form and are evilly subjected to change, their acquisition is actually an endless process, starting over and over. Now, taking the newly acquired artworks from the exhibition Biomedia and Early Life that Beatrice described, I will try to illustrate my point and show you how we anticipate on future problem at the very moment of acquisition. So for Empathy Swarm, we have about 40 autonomous robots, 25 in exhibition, 40 in total for spares. And like Beatrice said, it's uh, very demanding in terms of maintenance in exhibition. Batteries must be changed. The wear and tear of the robot have to be repaired during the whole length of the exhibition. We had a lot of uh, broken shell or, or wheels that were gone. So heavy maintenance. But the robots were created by the artists and manufactured according to their specification. The video tracking system is made of a real sense depth camera and the robots are tracked with a small Arduino camera. The custom made software is hosted by a computer running Windows 10. At the time of acquisition, we provided uh, Catherine and Adam with a non-exhausted list of the type of information and files we would need in order to exhibit, maintain, and preserve this work in the future. Among others, we ask for specification of the OS and any software dependencies, like all the drivers, all the libraries, everything. We ask also to provide us with source code or source files with comments uh, when possible, um, with a readme along that so that the source code is more understandable. We ask also to provide uh, source code and software that are loaded on ESP modules because sometimes you are not finding only software on computers, but also on diverse components on PCBs. For the computer, minimum specs. For the hardware components, we, we ask for specification of model of suppliers, we ask a bomb, so a bill of material for anything which is on the um, on the PCB uh, of the robot. We discuss this list during a meeting in front of the work 
during the dismantling after the end of Biomedia exhibition. With experience, we noticed that the one-to-one -one in real life talk are more efficient than email exchanges. Building a trusty relationship is very important for the future of the artwork. So we agreed with the artist that the documentation process will take months, if not, if not years, as we noticed that there were many variations possible in the setup according to his, the exhibition space. And we decided also to make the next three setups with them to observe their decision making and document it. So Catherine first proceeded with cleaning up the computer and making screenshots uh, to explain the setup and calibration processes, as well as the turn on and off machine uh, uh, routines. The source code, as well as the EDE and code uh, editor installers, in this case, Visual, Visual Studio and Processing, were already on the computer. The computer was used to program the artwork, so everything was on it, source code, everything. So we proceeded with a disk image of the hard disk drive. What remains to secure is the code that is directly on the robot and that cannot be backed up like the Arduino and the ASP32 code. Adam gathered everything about the robot, meaning the CAD for the PCD, PCB, the list of components on it, and the option for productions, very important, the layers, material, thickness, spacing, solder mask, finishing, because the PCBs are visible in exhibitions. We just also started uh, the process of buying spare parts for the components to avoid pressure of delivering time and lack of stock if a component is faulty. So we ask for 100 wheels, 20 motors, 20 casing, and 20 populated PCBs as spare parts. Because from experience, after one year exhibition, only the wheels were the most um, consumable in this. Motors were quite robust, so we decided 20 will be a good start to, for the next five to 10 years. And actually, Catherine and Adam are offering us their own stock of wheels and motors as they are already no longer produced. The resin used for printing the casing has become also very hard to find in Europe. Luckily, we are safe so far for the production of the PCBs as all components are still available. So you see here how the time is accelerating so much. Where we, are still, where we still can find components for the interactive print growing interface from the 90s, components of an artwork produced in 2018 are already outdated. So the artists for so Adrian, uh, Adam and Catherine have now access to our wiki to check the documentation and had change correct information and write the documentation along with us. And they are working now on some know-how, how to set up the computer from scratch, how to troubleshoot the robots, how to turn on and off manuals. And on our side, we are repairing some of the robots that were damaged during the Biomedia exhibition. Next is Archaeobot. So like uh, Beatrice said, it takes the form of an underwater robot. Um, for this acquisition, I had the impression of already knowing the artists as they sent us a video describing the whole building process of the work beforehand. It's a 17 minute video that allowed us to install the artwork already without the assistance of the artists. Even if this artwork is compared to other very complex digital artwork, it looks really rather simple and plug and play, but the combination of water and electronics will, and was already at the moment of conception of this artwork, a challenge. So I met Anna and Alex in March this year to interview them about the work. The main focus of our talk, among other topics like uh, their creative and experimental process, was on the sustainability of the robot over the years on exhibitions. The artists were used to exchange the robot upon requests when a motor was failing or coming uh, on site to reattach the now wild tails. I explained them that this know-how must be transferred to the ZKM team now, and we should be able to reproduce the robot from scratch from, for the middle to long-term preservation of the work. So just like their explanatory video, Anna and Alex provided us with a very descriptive photo novel 
of how to change the motors with all the information on how to make them waterproof and so on. The list of components was secured on the wiki with notes on how to get them and uh, build some of the components. The 3D files to print the shell of the robot was also made available to us. The source code, software designation and common lines, uh, common lines accompanied with a readme text file with the software built details were provided upon request as well. And as the Raspberry Pi Zero uh, used as the brain of this under ro one underwater robot uh, is still available today, per uh, spares will be purchased uh, as well. The motors, however, are no longer produced already. So Anna and Alex are now trying to find an alternative solution for them that might require to change the shell of the robots. So to be continued. As you could see with those three case study, the acquisition is the two case studies. The acquisition is fundamental for the future preservation of the works, even if it's not the most photogenic part of our job, as it is mainly documentation and preventive conservation. What happens after acquisition is what I call the perpetration marathon. Conservation of digital and media artworks knows only one rule, the proactivity. It is just basic computer forensics common sense, if there is too much time between two conservation efforts, the technological gap will be too huge to fill in to make the artwork operate again. The knowledge, the skills, the people and the machines will be gone and the accumulated technological depth will be simply too high to be solved. In the 90s, this standardized approach to managing complex digital artworks didn't exist yet. So when I started the overall assessment of the ZKM digital art collection that led to successive restoration campaigns, I targeted the artworks that were the most exhibited uh, within their historical environment and had which a kind of a critical moment, a technological discontinuity because of either a lack of spares, of technical documentation or source code. I would like now to give you two examples of uh, this technological depth. So Touch Me uh, from Alba Turbano is displayed on this 15 CRT, um, 15 inch, inch uh, CRT touchscreen, four by three ratio, it's important. So the visitor's action of touching the screen is detected by a touchscreen driver hosted on a Windows 95 computer. The live video of the visitors is captured by a camera connected to an ISA video capture card installed inside the PC. The Artworks program, it's a combination of a video integration software and the offering program Micromedia Director, is in charge of analyzing the visitor's input and triggering the appropriate reaction, meaning the superimposition between the self-portrait and the live video footage. So like I said, one of the common challenge in preserving, in preserving software-based artwork is actually artware failure. Here, the CRT monitor of touchscreen of TouchMe started to show signs of fatigue in exhibition and finally died. As this CRT was modified with an added touch panel using analog capacitive sensing technology glued to the old picture tube, the monitor remained irreparable and no spares could be found. It was very rare. So we therefore decided to replace it with a TFT touchscreen with the same four by three ratio because we can still find some in 15 inch and a capacitive surface in order to keep the same feeling while touching the screen, meaning a hard glass surface. But here, the technological gap between Windows 95 and this new screen is too big. There is no driver available. So the Artworks programs was developed with the famous offering program, Micromedia Director. As we have the source of the Micromedia Director project and could open it on the initial computer on which the program is installed, we considered proceeding to the migration of the project to the latest version of Director, Director 12, compatible with Windows 7, and therefore with our contemporary computer, and then with our newly bought TFT touchscreen. Unfortunately, Director is discontinued in, in, uh, since 2017 and can no longer be bought. 
So here, the escalation of technological discontinuities is such that we have to rewrite the software entirely at this point. What was a basic hardware issue, changing the display, led to the change of the OS and therefore of the computer and therefore of the program and driver and ESA card. Because the, maybe I, I forgot to say, yeah, because there's no driver for TFT touchscreen on Windows 95. I don't know if I said that. So yeah, so this led to a complete change. So co my colleague Mathieu Vlamanc exported all the images of the animations from the project and recombining them now on the new processing program. Here you can see a screenshot of the Micromedia Director project where each animation is programmed with the uh, green screen effect. Anticipation is the key. So with Memory Theater VR, which is still shown on its original hardware and software, an SGI Indigo 2 maximum impact, uh, running a, a runtime of soft image 3D, we had to do it earlier. So early technologies are sometimes easier to maintain than today's technology. But for this, you need knowledge and you need spare parts. So for this computer, we have spares available, a lot of them, but we do not have the source code of this artwork. And we are also losing progressively the hardware and software skills in our team uh, for this type of environment. Emulation of SGI IRIX system is not an option, especially for 3D, because the architecture is too different and our computers today cannot handle it. So since the source project is not available this time, the extraction and conversion of all the 3D objects in the artwork, as well as all the embedded uh, films, were uh, extracted. Uh, the, the, their extraction was the only way to preserve the artwork's aesthetic and historicity. So David Link uh, is a media archaeologist and artist, and Mathieu Vlamanc took care of extracting all of those 3D models from the initial environment and integrate them into OpenGL program for a newer operating system. So here, by being proactive, we could compare both versions during this recording process. There is, again, no visible differences between the 1997 version and today's version. Learning from interactive plan growing, we used widely used libraries for an easier migration also in the future. To conclude, I would like to say that exhibition is a form of preventive conservation of technological watch. So a media or digital artwork that is in storage for, for a long time is a dying artwork. Only when they are in operation can possible damage be immediately detected and repaired. A computer or electrical system that remains off for an extended period of time sometimes cannot be resurrected. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Morgan and Beatrice. That was an amazing talk, um, going through so many different details. Um, I'd now like to open the floor to questions. I'm sure there must be some questions from the audience. Um, has anybody got anything pressing? There's one from Charlotte there. Um, can you unmute yourself or shall I uh, mute you? Oh, uh, sorry, that was just a clap. Oh, it was a clap. <laughs> Not sorry. a raising hand. No question. But, yeah, okay. Thanks so much for the talk. <laughs> okay. Um, Sean, have you got any questions? Yes, I have a, a couple of questions. <laughs> um, I'm familiar with some of these problems that you've described, um, although you've obviously explored them in huge amounts of detail. I've often found that old computers have a particular problem, which is their capacitors stop working. And one thing I've had to do with old computers to get them to run old software is to replace all the capacitors in there. I guess you have that experience and people who are able to do that for you. You don't yeah. have to do soldering on yet. My colleague, Mathieu Vlamanc, is actually a tinkerer and he learned by himself to repair computer and we need people like this in museums. <laughs> and uh, yeah. so yeah. he was hired to do those kind of work. He actually worked on so many computers like Amiga, 
three thousand or the Apple II. That also, era, isn't it? It's the nineteen eighties ones that are going now. Yeah. And so the first thing he is doing is testing the capacitors, changing the CMOS batteries because they are leaking. Mm -hmm. uh, we have now a system also for Amiga 3000, for example, he is installing the um, CMOS battery outside of the, like with, is installing it outside of the casing so that yeah. we can remove it easily for storage. So, because it's quite tricky to remove it from Amigas, they are not so visible. So mm -hmm. we thought maybe, no, like, it will take so much time to dismantle each Amiga before putting them in storage. So the easiest way was to delocalize the CMOS battery outside. So, and and then one thing I found was that the oldest piece of work we have in our computer arts collection that runs, the oldest piece of um, digital work that runs, was actually something written for the ZX Spectrum, and. The great thing there is that because it was a gaming platform, it's there's a big community around it. And there are still people who want to play ZX Spectrum games. So we were able to get hold of software, but also hardware emulators that are able to run this software. So I, I did wonder if there's something to be said about artists using games platform, platforms if they want their work to last into the future. Um, if you were... You know, you could be using Xbox or at least Unity, the use software that the industry uses to help ensure your artwork survive. You mean if we are like we are in community, we are in contact with a lot of communities from video game because they found mm. solutions for like way before museums started to think about it. Yeah, uh, it's the entry points which is not easy. When you are a conservator and you want to enter those world of uh, retro gaming and um, those uh, tinkerer hobbyist um, communities, the the way to reach them is very difficult in many many times. So the fact that Mathieu is now in our team and he is part of this community was our bridge to this whole world shiny that we never thought about uh, entering mm. contact with. So now we are so happy because he is in those network and he is able to ask for help in uh, underground uh, places mm. that I don't know. And so, yeah, this is this is how we, we made the connection with those communities by hire, hiring one of them in the team. That's good, yeah. And, and then one just have a quick question is, um, what do you think of the role of virtual machines is in ensuring that old hardware even if you don't physically have old hardware, you can still run old code. Does that have a value for you? Yeah, we are using this, for example, to try to document uh, software without using the original computer. <laughs> we are doing this also. Uh, we are using emulation and virtualization to uh, test our backups just to be sure that everything went well. Mm -hmm. But we are not really using it for display. Why? Because like I said, it's a lot of interfaces uh, mm. using for example serial or SCSI and this is very hard for those handmade interfaces to find a way to emulate those or to just connect them to a new computer which mm. is uh, running the virtual machine like how to we have adapter USB to serial but how do you do for SCSI like and so Usually we are always confronting ourselves with an hardware issue where we cannot connect physically with an, mm. with an interface. And so we have few cases where we can use uh, emulation or virtualization, very few. Okay. I guess that's where having a microcontroller expert in the team helps because you can often make. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is what we are looking for now, more time to develop those kind of things. It's yeah. just no, it's really uh, interesting. time consuming. The experience you've collected, you've got... Um, I think it's fascinating and very necessary, very needed. Thank you. I think um, we've got a question in the chat from uh, Chris J. King. Did you want to ask that yourself, Chris, or shall I read that out? I can, uh, if, you, if you want to ask it, you can. Well, I'll, I'll read it out anyway. Um, uh, Chris says, Morgan, do you have a way to decide which files you save as preservation components? And he goes on, um, they go on. At Tate, we might also migrate, but I often find it difficult to decide which stage in the process to snapshot for future conservators. For example, when decompiling Flash to FLV, et cetera. Yes. Oh, a lot of question in the question. Um, 
which files to, I would say all of them, and even the one you think it uses is not useless. <laughs> everything, everything. Last time I, I, I had the mm. CAD of, screen, of screws just to show you exactly the size of the screw and I kept it. Uh, I could have just written M4 screw, but I kept it. We never know what you, what you need. I think if you have the space, uh, we just do not decide. We take everything. Like we, when we did with Anna uh, and Alex, we just gathered everything we could. And even when Alex was saying, do you think it's really necessary? Yeah, take, we take everything. <laughs> And um, also for the migration, the thing is, we are n we never had really the case of migration. We always completely rewrite. We we are we we have a, a collection that is so old, and where they were no conservator for so long, and so we are directly at this moment where the gap is too big and we cannot migrate anymore. Like for Macromedia Director, I'm great, thank you. <laughs> Um, we had a question from Colin Sanderson. Um, did you want to ask it, Colin, or shall I read it? I'll read it um, unless you join. Um, he said it's very thought provoking. Thank Sorry, you. So you go ahead. Yes. No, no. You, if you're there, please, please. Oh well, I was just thinking comparatively across uh, different institutions. I mean, ZKM is art and technology and so on, but, but science institutions, medical institutions as such, and uh, thinking of engineering and technology places, like uh, I gave the example of the Deutsches Museum. So I'm wondering, I mean, there could almost be a special association for conservation of these digital works. I don't know, Beatrice, if you are having communication for exhibitions, but for our on our side, we are part of the network uh, of all the technical and communication and uh, uh, how you say it's uh, technical, yeah, technical museum. We are part of a network and we are discussing together because they are looking for also ways to show software and show computers uh, more alive. In their museums and so this, they ask uh, they invited us uh, zkm to be part of this network so we can help them uh, select or emulate or migrate or do something so that the, the exhibitions are more um, alive than just showcasing um, computers as plastic heritage so we are totally in contact with them uh, as since uh, since COVID, since a bit before COVID, so 2019, and we are helping them in their mission. Uh, they are not helping us in our mission because their computer are really objects of collection. And when we ask for a computer, it's usually to dismantle it, to take the parts, to repair another computer. So they are not really uh, happy about this, but uh, we are happy to help them on, on their mission. And, uh, we are always, always saying when I'm doing tours in exhibition, we are not a technical museum. We are not here to show you computers, but it's really cool to see what artists were doing with those computers. So it's really like this research part, uh, really the cultural um, side of technology, which, which we are exploring. If I just, uh, one, one little name drop, I, you've actually provoked me that I, I know somewhere I have a, a mini work by Bill Bell at the Exploratorium. He had this wonderful thing with LED lights where if you scanned your eyes across, you would see various words. And I know I bought at MIT a tiny little one which showed petunia, geranium, etc., and it needs fixing. So thanks for provoking that, that thought to me. <laughs> Great, thanks, Colin. Um, is there any other questions from the audience? I think Ad Adrian has a question about Quantel paint box artworks, and if there are any of those in in the ZKM collection. I don't know what it is, and I never received email. 
about this. So I don't <laughs> I think we've got a, a Quantel paint box exhibition coming up or? That's it. That's right. In the um, BCS London offices, the Quantel paint box exhibition is moving there. Um, now, actually, the, the paint box is an interesting one because it's a 1980s computer. So it's from that era where computers are starting to have problems. And um, I, I, I know Adrian and Adrian has some <laughs> great contacts who are really obsessed with fixing these machines. <laughs> and that I think goes back to your point. You need to be part of that community. You need to find those people um, who have a deep interest in these things. Yeah, we'll do some research. Like there are some works made using Quantel in ZK, but in the free topics. Oh. So you mean that we have the hand product, the end product of the quintal. It's not using directly during exhibition, right? I think I think that's what they mean, unless mm. they want to speak and explain more. Yeah, uh, like I said, I'm software based art conservator. Uh, video is my other colleagues, so oh, well, it's also why I did a as well. Um, what? Some, it, Quantel was two dimensional as well. It was what uh, lots of artists used before Adobe came along. Okay. So, I think I think it was that spinny thing that we might remember from the old TV kind of it, it video art and stuff and like album that. Covers. It did all of that sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Well, our um, Christmas MTV era. <laughs> yeah, our Christmas um, um, presentation will be about the paint box with the paint box exhibition, and hopefully, a paint box will be there. So. Um, if people are interested in that, um, <laughs> log in <laughs> and join us, uh, or or join us in real life. Um, just checking through. David Bauer says, philosophic philosophically, is there a point at which the artwork is no longer the original artwork due to the replacement of parts, code, rewrite, etc.? Or is the art the final output as seen by the eye and not the hardware or the code, etc.? Which I have to say is a thought I had at one point, and we've we've had debates about this. Where's the art? Is the art in the code? Is the art in the artwork? I think, and then this idea that you could throw, you could actually throw away the code and have the rendered out, uh, rendered artwork, and it would still be the artwork. So maybe the art's not in the code. I know that's a a point that Alex Mays made in previous talks. So um, yeah, what do you think about that? Um, Morgan and Beatrice. I want to say that I did my PhD about that. No, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's just that I'm a media archaeologist, so I'm always uh, attached to the technology, to the hardware. And I really think, um, like you said, that there's one point where it's no longer the artwork. It's just because the artwork is really the produce, the, the product of a relationship between an artist and the technology that he came here to explore. Even if they say the technology is not the point, the technology was just here and I used it, this, the, this created a relationship between those two and a bridge between. And for me, this is where the art is, this moment. And when we are changing, when we are rewriting artwork with Mathieu, we are really like at the last point where it's only the display of the artwork, which is the point. We want to show the work again. But if it was only me, I would I would just stop showing them at one point. But I, I'm a I'm a conservator, so I I'm I'm, I'm here to preserve work, and I I don't have to. Uh, I can't. It's very hard to admit that you can let an artwork die. But yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult. At ZKM, we have this media archaeological approach, meaning we are trying as long as we can to maintain them in those in this original historical uh ecosystem but uh it's very heartbroken when we have to rewrite the work of someone else it's like rewriting someone else's book so it's it's uh yeah Beatrice Beatrice wanted to say something yeah thank you for the question I think there's a very interesting parallel between technological based art and bio based art as I explained with the installation by Earth of Earthling by Sasha Spashal, because it's so unpredictable 
how this work will look like in, in one space and in the other. So we can also argue here, is it actually the, the same piece that we are exhibiting now at ZKM as it was planned by Sasha? So it's changing like constantly also in terms of with which um, mi microbiomes we can work in the space, with which bacteria, what is allowed under which guidelines of the museums, what are the restrictions, and also with which scientists are working. So if we're working maybe sci with scientists outside from Germany, they have a different um, yeah, guidelines or, or expertise and maybe someone working in Germany. So it's it's so depending also on the on the local context where we're showing these pieces. So I think there's like a very nice parallel between um, the life stages of, of digital and biological based art. Um, yeah, philosophically speaking, but also materially speaking, it's it's like never the same again. Isn't, isn't a big part of it that if you see your artwork as a system, as a set of interacting parts that produce a whole, then so long as the interactions are in place, the parts don't necessarily have to be the identical parts that you create as long as the overall system is functioning. Because even a painting is not the same painting that it was when a, um, a Leonardo painted the Mona Lisa. It's not the same artifact. It may have been restored. It, it certainly has um, decayed in some ways. So you can never say an artwork is captured, is fixed forever. It's always changing. I was thinking it was a bit like storytelling is like the stories get passed down through generations mm. and we do our best to keep the story the same, but stories change over time. So I think there's an element of that um, involved as well. Is there any other questions? Oh, yeah, one from Paul. Um, yeah, hi, everybody. Um, with my own work, um, I've been recreating work that I did oh, back in the 70s in assembler code for many computers using Java um, and trying to uh, emulate the screen quality that I was getting then. And for me, that isn't a problem because it's the same artwork, although there is a historical um, difference between the original instantation which can no longer be reproduced and the, the new version but this reminds me of um tom defanti uh, of the sigraph organization in the states in the early 80s um because of the obsolescence of computing hardware and software made the decision that everything had to be documented in video because video was capable of being preserved over time and that led to the uh the SIGGRAPH video collection, which is a, a, a really magnificent uh, historical record of, what, 40, 50 years of, um, of innovation. Um, and I know that now people are creating virtual um, versions of artworks. And I think there's now a virtual version of uh, Ed and Sound Activated Mobile that was shown in 1968 at some um, Serendipity. Now, this comes back to the previous one. Is it the original artwork after it's been changed and put into another software medium? Um, there's a distinction between the artwork itself and the documentation of, 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 of the artwork. And um, are those issues that you're looking at at, at ZKN? I think I have an example from this. Is that we acquired artwork from Jeffrey Show from the 90s, oh, 80s, uh, so early 80s, end of 6, 70s, and they are no longer, uh, they don't exist anymore. But we acquired them as idea of the artwork. And what we did with Jeffrey is that he was interested in having a, something he could ex exhibit in a short time. So he made a new version. I don't know if you know the work, it's Virtual Sculptures. It's one of the early augmented reality uh, artworks. So you have a Fresnel lens, a half uh, transparent mirror, and a monitor, which is displaying different objects in the space. And so you can see them in front of you thanks to the paper ghost uh, system. And you have two handles to be able to explore the different objects in the space around you. And so this artwork doesn't exist. We don't have backups. We don't have nothing except some pictures. 
So on his side, he made it with a new uh, video processor. Like he did those wired objects from the Apple II uh, the graphic design of the time. And we acquired an Apple II. And we decided to reprogram all the objects in the library of the Apple II, uh, which is the ecologic uh, studio. It's lo uh, yeah, I don't remember the name of the library, but we downloaded it, we put it on the floppy, and we put it on the Apple II, and we started reprogramming in assembly language directly on the Apple II. And what's happened here was this transfer of generation, this excitement that we have, because we never knew the Apple II, we were not even born, but this excitement that we had to explore the Apple II again, like Jeffrey did in the 80s, this is this thing that happens that was very brilliant because this transfer of knowledge was happening. Even if he had he made a new version and we are secured, we can show this artwork in exhibition. This process of trying this technology again, having the same excitement to do it, to learn something from scratch, like the assembly language in 3D design for Apple II. And this is the thing we, we are very happy to be able to do in our research department because taking this time is important. And also for, for just for the knowledge transfer on technology is very important. But yeah, a reconstruction happens. Um, Beatrice showed a uh, colloquy of mobile from Gordon Pask. This is a complete reconstruction by students from the University of Detroit. So, and uh, with, with Arduinos actually. But uh, it's also good for people to see a representation of what was colloquy of mobiles and what was kinetic art at the time. We just have to be didactic and explain that it's not the original one and it's a reconstruction but they can have like a better than a video, they can experience it in the exhibition space. So both can coexist. It's just about historicity, explaining things. So we can re so we can give an historicity for to those pieces. Because the problem is we can update everything and make everything shiny and erase historicity from exhibitions. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, we've got one from Paul. Hello, thank you very much. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I, I'm, I find this endlessly fascinating. Uh, uh, I know these, these topics come up so much about um, certainly the, the, the ship of Theseus kind of problem with a lot of the uh, you know, use of technology. My question really has to do with um, it's it's or I'm a, I'm curious to know what type of conversations or um, what you glean as curators from the performing arts world. There's a great deal of how performing arts preservation is dealt with. I know John uh, uh their book uh, Recollection, which deals a little bit with proposing that you know new media and media based arts are more of a notation based system. And thinking through some of these kinds of ideas, I'm just I'm just kind of curious about the interface and what you've what you glean from performing arts mode modes of preserving uh, that you find yourself transferring to to you know your your sort of practices. And you you talk about curators, so I think yeah. the question is for Beatrice. Because, um, Sorry, can you repeat your question? My internet is very slow, so. Sure, I, I understand. It's 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 more of um. I'm I'm curious to know. W either what conversations you're having with people who are preserving works in the performing arts, specifically performing arts, maybe that are working with technology, or maybe not even, um, and or. Uh, you know, what other lessons you you draw from the performing arts in terms of dealing with the ephemeral nature of sort of the technical systems that are put in place for the delivery of ideas? Maybe like specifically pe performing arts? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not like something that we categorizing so much or I don't like have a specific example of performing arts in the last exhibitions, but I mean, what also 
if something is like moment based, I mean, similar as, for example, um, the robots that we show by Katrin Hochschul and Adam Donovan, which is also a performance, you can say, with robots sure, sure. and humans. So like every minute it was something different and every time something changed and it was unpredictable and Katrin even didn't know that the robots will behave like this. Like she looked into the source code, code and it was like very surprising for her that this even happened. So if we can talk about this like human and non-human performance, I think this is like an, an ongoing thing and how Morgan, des uh, Morgan described it, like how, how can you keep track of what is happening? Like we have the code, we have the software, we understand like practically how it works, but what if we are turning on this 25 robots again, will it still work the same? Like right. we don't know. <laughs> so will like the colors that were like matching to different movement patterns be the same? We don't know. So I think as for the artist, so it was for us like every time this exhibition, especially like a testing ground for a lot of art pieces. And um, so this mm. was like my closest like um, collaboration with performance, let's say, because it depends so much on, on human interaction in that moment, much more than um, argumented reality or virtual reality. Um, so yeah, it, it needs, it needs to understand the interaction first, which is like an ongoing process of understanding the, the social behavior of humans in the first place. So yeah, it's a mm. huge topic. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, thank you for all the questions. I think we're going to have to sort of wind it up at this point. I want to give a big personal thanks to Morgan and Beatrice for this amazing talk with so much detail. And I think it's given all of us so much to think about. And bear in mind when we're making our own artworks as well. Um, and so so that's great. So a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. And if you have questions, you can just always drop us an email. Um, I think there are somewhere on the website. Otherwise, I can just put it in the chat. Okay. Yeah, put it in the chat. I'm just going to give a little plug to our next month's talk, which is post-internet curation, online ecologies of the Web 2.0 era, which is by um, Peter Ariola Burns and Elliot Burns, who will discuss post-internet curation and their project, Offsite Project, which is an online curatorial platform they founded in 2017. And they've got a very strong interest in net art, but from a very contemporary perspective. So it's like amazing research and a lot of amazing knowledge around net art, which I think is something that we haven't talked about for a while in the BC, uh, in the Computer Art Society talk. So it'd be nice to see that. And I'm chairing that one as well. So um, I look forward to seeing many of you um, next time. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It was super great. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you all very much. That was great. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.